you have a bulletin, I take it, and you have many little pieces of paper like I have. I'm just giving you another chance to be reminded that one of the pieces of paper is requiring your uh, memory of names, even if it's your mother, you're allowed to put her name there. Now, it should be somebody in the church. This is your opportunity to act on behalf of the big committee. That's what it's called. You are the big committee today, and you get to help us elect the nominating committee. So that is what that piece of paper is there for. Uh, thank you so much for coming today. Some of you may have said to your favorite person, I don't really want to go today. And then your favorite person said, but you know what? We need to take our child. Or we, mom's going, and so we've got to meet mom there. Or, you know, maybe you said, Pastor Mike is going to talk about salt in the spring. I've just got to find out what that's all about. So whatever the reason is that you are here today, I'm very glad because we have an opportunity to hear from a story in the Old Testament that I believe will leave you with no doubt that Jesus came to fulfill that which was prophesied about him. And that even in the actions of a prophet, that his whole mission was prefigured. Now, big words sometimes confuse people. So just know that as you review the story with me today, you will have an opportunity to maybe think about what was happening in the time of Jesus, especially, hint, 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 after he left. So let's get to it. You have in your scriptures today, I, and I really am going to emphasize this again, I've, I've told a lot of people, I tell my congregation, please make sure you have your Bible on your phone. And then some of the older pastors say, oh, but I don't want them looking at their phones in church. Yes, I know that you're on Facebook, and I know that you know, you're checking your mail, I understand that. However, I also would love to know that you have your Bibles on your phone. And the AV guys back there are going to jump for joy on the day that I stand up here just with my phone. I've told them I'm, I'm still a pen and paper guy uh, to the extent that I'm not using my phone as much and I, I still have my trusty Bible. So either way, turn in your Bibles to our text for today in 2 Kings, and let's look at the story there. We're going to start with the fact that in this story, the context is that Elijah has just gone up to heaven in a whirlwind. So there's your first hint about Jesus. So be paying attention. Okay, Elijah has just gone up to heaven in a whirlwind. Fifty of the prophet people who were at the school of the prophets, fifty of those guys saw Elijah go up into heaven and they saw the cloak that Elijah had used to cross the river Jordan. Remember, he took his cloak off and for all of those who, who like, you know, Lord of the Rings and all that kind of stuff, this is the story in the Bible where you can say that, you know, there was a cloak used, and it may have had some magical powers by the looks of things, but really it was the name in which Elijah called down an action. He took that cloak, wound it up, and he flicked the waters with it as we see him cross the Jordan, he crosses on dry land. He goes up to heaven in a whirlwind, and Elisha knows that he has now received that which he asked for. Because Elijah said, if you see me go up, 
Which, by the way, those 50 prophets also knew that Elijah was going to go up. How? They must have been informed by God. And remember last week we read that Elisha was told by those prophets, your master is going to leave you today. And what did he tell them? Three times. Shush. That's the nice way of saying it. Others might have said, shut up. Because he didn't want his master to leave. He didn't want this apprenticeship to go. And so when Elijah said, wait here for me, I'm going on, he kept saying, no, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not, I, I want to stay with you. And then he asked for a double portion of the spirit of Elijah to rest on him. That's another big hint. Elijah goes up in the whirlwind, he drops his cloak, and Elisha picks up the cloak. He does an action which we don't have in Western society, but it is a Middle Eastern custom that when you are in extreme grief, you rip your clothes. That a relationship, it's significant of the fact that a relationship has been ripped apart. Now in movies or in, in, in situations, you see people who are, who are in, in just abject agony and grief, and they will tear at their hair. or their, you, know, they, you, you, just, you just want something to give because that's how your heart is at that moment. And so that is what we see Elisha doing. He rips his own clothes to show his grief at being parted from his mentor, Elijah. But then he picks up the cloak and he asks a very important question to this whole situation. Where is the God of Elijah? I have asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Where is this God to give me that spirit? And then he wraps up that cloak, he wraps up that cloak, and he strikes the water. And just as with Elijah, the water parts. And Elisha goes through on dry land as well. The 50 guys that are watching this happen say, okay, we saw the waters part for Elijah. Now we see the waters part for Elisha. The same God that was with Elijah is now with Elisha. That's important to know. It's important to remember because of what we said we are looking for, and that is the comparison between this situation and another situation in the New Testament. There are cues that, that you could have and should have already picked up about the situation that a number of commentators have commented on that there is a direct parallel between this story and another story that we will talk about in a moment. So we come to Jericho. Where is Jericho? Anyone want to guess? Well, for starters, it's 1,500 feet below sea level. When you're in Jerusalem, you are at about 3,200, 3,300 feet up. Jerusalem's pretty high. I've, I've lived there. And it snows, and it's cold. And there's not a lot of buildings with central heating. I visited a number of my students who I was teaching English to, and they had... Uh, propane burners like you would cook something on. They had those on because that was their source of heat in these houses that were not meant for cold so much as they were meant to keep you cool in extreme hot temperatures, which is most of the year, of course. Big, thick stone walls, very cool inside, actually very difficult to keep warm. So people wear lots of clothes all the time. And when they go to bed, they 
have lots of covers because there isn't a lot of central heating. But Jericho, Jericho is down, down, down. When you take the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, to this day, if you're uh, watching for it, because it's not a huge sign, but there is, there is a pillar on the right side of the road as you're going down into the Dead Sea Valley that tells you that you are now going down below sea level for the rest of the world. Yes, the Dead Sea Valley is, is the lowest place on the face of the earth that doesn't have water covering it. I think the Mariana Trench, which has water covering it in the Pacific Ocean, is the deepest crevice on the surface of the earth. But the one that doesn't have water in it is the Dead Sea Valley. And it is in the Dead Sea Valley. Which I would like to make a comparison to what David said in Psalm 23 today and say that it is the valley of the shadow of death. We happen to be in the Santa Clarita Valley. Anybody think that they are immortal right now? So you know that the Santa Clarita Valley could also be the valley where the shadow of death is still hanging over all of us. So if you want to contemporize the story, just understand that until Jesus comes and changes everything, we are still living in the valley of the shadow of death. Jericho is, is, is the city. Now, we know the story of what happened with Joshua and he fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. God did that. And the archaeologists have confirmed it. Now, they were big mud walls, and you can go to Jericho today, and the tell of the old city of Jericho is there, and it's not a lot bigger than our property here in Santa Clarita. So if you think of a big city, you need to think again. The size of the tell would probably be this five-acre plot that we have here. They have dug trenches to see where, where the walls were, and there are some famous uh, archaeologists that have posited how this could happen, but there is general consensus that when Jericho was taken, the walls fell out. In Joshua 6, verse 26, we read that Joshua puts a curse. He puts a curse on whoever would decide to rebuild Jericho after they completely destroyed it and completely destroyed every living thing in it. Very interestingly, that was what the command of God was, was to recognize that Jericho stood for a death culture and that it was to be completely destroyed Joshua puts a curse on whoever would try to rebuild Jericho that he would lose his oldest son and he would also lose his youngest son. So uh, youngest sons, raise your hand. I see one right here. Youngest sons, you would be on the list. Oldest sons, raise your hand. You would be on the list, okay? Uh, you know? So why would a father go against this? Well, the fact is that it was Ahab's time. All that time they'd had kings both in Judea and also in Samaria. And Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord and he died. Ahab, his son, took over from him. And he too did everything that Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had done, and worse. He went to Sidon and made a deal with the king of Sidon, and he signed the deal with a wedding ring. He married the king's daughter, who was also the high priestess of the Baal cult. 
He set up a temple to Baal in Samaria, and he also set up an Asherah pole. And if you don't think, well, if you think that, that these kinds of religions just existed back then, do understand that when you see those bumper stickers that say, love your mother, and there's a picture of the earth, that that religion is still very much alive today. Very much alive. Hiel of Bethel, a city we're going to hear about next week. Hiel of Bethel rebuilt the city of Jericho and he lost his oldest and his youngest son. We read about that in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 34. The curse came true. So what we can understand about this picture is here you have Elijah has gone up into heaven. Elisha has picked up the mantle. He has walked across on dry land. He heads into Jericho, a place that has been rebuilt and that has also been cursed. What do they say to him? Well, it's very interesting, and we, if we were to think very carefully, might actually have said the same thing about the Santa Clarita Valley. We like living here. This is a great place. Except. They come to Elisha and they say, this is, this is a great place. We, we like living in Jericho. You ever, you ever thought about the ramifications of that? This is a city that was destroyed by God. It was cursed by Joshua. It Actually, the curse came true, and now you have people living in that city and liking it. That's sick. That, that, that's, that's pretty distant from the idea, I believe, that, that God intended when he brought his people into the land of Canaan. From slavery into freedom. Thank you for bringing that up. It's a perfect peace to remember. Joshua, Yeshua, brings the people of Israel out of the wilderness and into the land of promise, into the land of Canaan. And the first thing that happens is that the stronghold, the stronghold of Jericho is destroyed, not by anyone else's might, but by the might of the God of heaven, who reestablishes his relationship with his people. So now these many years later, and under the guidance of Ahab, with his sidekick Jezebel, a different rebellious relationship has been established with God. And so his man, to whom the mantle has been passed, walks into Jericho. One problem. Bad water. Now some of you, some of you may have, have, have had this, this happen to you, but <laughs> there are places that I have lived or people who are friends of mine who must buy uh, water treatment for their house. Because if you drink the tap water, it smells like muddy frog water. If you live in an area, uh, as I have in like the state of Ohio, where there is a lot of fracking that's going on and gas wells and oil wells, they sit on top of a probably the largest supply of oil in the United States right now. And a lot of people have problems with their water. It stinks. You kind of have to hold your nose when you drink it. It doesn't actually taste bad, but that initial smell of sulfur just really is repugnant. Makes me want to turn up my nose just thinking about it. But this water was not just smelly. 
This water was harmful. This water was bringing death. And we know this, read it in about five different versions and also talked to, uh, well, read several commentators. Um, if you have the New International Version, that was probably the least helpful in this particular search. The Jerusalem Bible was probably the most helpful because it says that the people were having miscarriages. The animals were having miscarriages. And the Bible, the, the revised version from England says the trees were casting their fruit too early. So you have an unproductive situation here in the valley of the shadow of death. It's trying to approximate life and it just can't do it. That's the problem. That's the problem in Jericho. It is trying to be a nice place. But it just doesn't have that spark of life in it. And so God's man comes walking in and the very first thing that he is asked is, would you please help us with our bad water situation? Now, I don't know about you, but that's, that is probably what, what any God-fearing person would love to hear if they walked into a place that was in rebellion against God. Could you please help us? We are dying here. Could you help us? Elisha calls for a new bowl. I'm going to direct your attention. If you're taking notes, put down 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7, where, it's, where it says that we are jars of clay. We are jars of clay. And that we have precious things in us. And then if you add to that, which I, I find very interesting, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, that we are also a new creation. I heard Brother Milt talking about that in Sabbath school today. If you were here discussing in the Santa Clarita synagogue, you didn't know we had synagogue here, right? I, I did see the Orthodox Jewish guys walking home from Friday night services last night. And I thought to myself, you know, there are some other people preparing for a service. So thank you, band members, for preparing for us last night on the Sabbath, preparing to praise God together. But it says that we are a new creation. So here Elisha asks for a new bowl. It's new and it's a bowl. Very important. Two separate ideas. It's new. It has never been used before and it has been now created. It is made out of earthenware, made out of dirt. Paul says that we are a new creation in Christ and that we hold very important things because that's where we go next. He asks for salt to be put in. Name that chapter. Come on. Where are the Beatitudes? Matthew chapter 5. And it says, Jesus' words, you are the salt of the earth. Very interesting. Salt is put into this new bowl. And then he goes to the spring and he takes the salt. Now the spring is full of bad water. In Scripture, water often represents people. Lots of people, usually. And he takes this bowl, this new bowl, full of salt, and he throws the salt into the spring, and then he makes a pronouncement. He's pronouncing the words of God. This this spring will not be a source of death anymore. It will be a source of life. No more will there be 
trees and animals and people who are not productive as a result of this water. It's now going to be the water of life. They like to say things like this in the Bible. And, and so it was, and so it is to this day. Now, I, I, I didn't bother because I had maybe not read this text enough when I was in Israel to go and look for and see if there is still a spring today in Jericho. I mean, there's a modern Jericho today, and there's also the, the old, you know, the tell which would have been the city that they go in. There it is. Okay, so there's, there's one today. All right. Elisha's spring and fountain. You know, when you go to Israel, you have to be able to find all of this stuff. And there are people who have made sure. You know what I'm saying? They've made sure that there is something to look at because the pilgrims need a place to come and see what it is. And that's been going on for hundreds of years. And uh, shall we say, whoever was in Israel at the time was the beneficiary of the uh, tourism that went on. And there are those who came to me last Sabbath and said, Pastor Greg took us to Israel. It's time to go again. I said, sure. Anytime. So if you have a hankering to see Elisha's well, we can arrange that. We can arrange that for reals. He pronounces this blessing upon. This spring in Jericho will no longer be a source of death, it will now be a source of life. So what can we expect? What can we, what can we learn? Well, I, I have a question for myself, having read this, and, and so I'm just going to ask you the same questions that I have for myself. Am I, are we, seeking the God of Elijah? The God that sent fire from heaven and burnt up the altar in, uh, on, the Mount, uh, on Mount Carmel. And just as a hint for next week, did you, did you hear two, two cities that, that Elisha is going to visit? He's going to visit them next week. So you can't miss it, okay? Because we're going to talk about Bethel or Beit El, which in Hebrew means the house of God. And then he goes on where to? Mount Carmel. Why did he do that? Come next week and you'll find out. Because after that he comes back to Samaria, which is the capital of that area. Are we seeking the God of Elijah? And have we recently asked, where is that God in my life? Do we really, really want that God does do do we want the same spirit that possessed Elijah now some of you Adventist historians will know when I say that Adventists have often liked to call themselves the Elijah people so if you remember that know that I'm thinking that right now and I'm thinking do we really want the spirit that possessed Elijah to possess us just like Elisha said, I want a double portion. It's like as if your, your mentor was Spider-Man and, and you said, I don't want to just be Spider-Man, I want to be Spider-Man and Batman. You see? I mean, have you had a prayer? Have you, have you had a talk with, with, with God about that? Are you really, really interested in that spirit taking possession of your life, taking you over and leading out in your life? That's a, that's a question that I have to ask. You see, because 50 days, here comes what I told you we talk about, 50 days after Jesus rose from the grave, the Spirit of God fell on people who were wanting it to fall upon them. Jesus said, go back to Jerusalem and the Comforter, the Spirit, will come and will come beside you. The, the Greek word is parakletos, which means parallel, the one who comes beside. 
If you want that in your life, you have to be obedient to God and you have to want it. And then when he sends it, he, he, he does so in amazing ways. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. It was a celebration that had many people from all over the empire, the Roman Empire, in Jerusalem at the same time. And these were some of the same people who heard this commotion going on and they thought that they were just partying. So that's why in, in Acts chapter 2, Peter begins by saying, Brothers, <laughs> we are not drunk. We are not high. We are possessed by the Spirit, the same Spirit that possessed Elijah, the same Spirit in double portion that Elisha asked into his life. That's the, that's the Spirit that, that we are possessed by. The Spirit of Jesus Christ. We, we know Jesus to be the God of heaven and we want His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to come in and take possession of our lives. That sounds like giving up. And to a certain extent, there is a giving up that needs to happen. The people of Jericho knew what it was like to live in a town that was cursed it was cursed with death. There was a death culture that was pervading that area and it was causing physical maladies and it was also causing mental distress. And I mean, does that sound familiar? Have, have you seen any of that this week? Did you see it on TV? Question, are, are we seeking the God of Elijah? Do, do, we, do we want the same outpouring of that spirit in our lives so that we ooh, can be salt and light? Can't be salt if you have lost your savor, Jesus says in Matthew 5. If you are not salt for reals, you are going to be used for another purpose, which will be pavement. Pavement where other people will walk as they continue to look for God instead of being what you hoped to be. You see, because even a quick comparison of these two stories, we can see that these similar times, Ahab's time, folks, Ahab and Jezebel, a traitor and a witch. These are the same times that we are living in right now. Okay? Question I have is, uh, and if you've, if you've happened to peruse your scriptures recently and you, you have come across the book of Romans, maybe you avoid it. I don't know. Some people avoid it because they think it's just too much. Don't avoid it. Romans is, Romans is one of, of, of Paul's greatest books to the Christians in Rome, the thinking people of the empire. He begins in chapter 1 by talking about a group of people who know God, they can see Him in nature, they know His power, but they have turned away, and they've walked the other way, and they have refused, they have refused to believe in that God. Sound familiar? Do we live in an age where people look at the, the, the creation that we believe has come from God, and they don't believe that it comes from God? They believe it evolved. Now, I do believe in microevolution. How come we have so many different kinds of dogs? Okay. But I believe in a creator God. And I know that when, when they read this letter for the first time, and maybe even for the tenth time, they, they were feeling very good, these Christians in Rome. They were feeling very good about themselves, and they were probably clapping for Paul and saying, you get them, Paul. This is, this is the people that live around us. This is, this is the people who, 
who we see every day in our lives, they don't believe in the same God. That even though they can see that he's created the world, they turn away into the darkness of their own minds. But then there's Romans chapter 2. So I've gone to calling the, the people that I find in the world Romans chapter 1 people or Romans chapter 2 people. Because in Romans chapter 2, he says, and now you. Whoa. <laughs> it was real good, Paul, when you, you, you were talking about those godless heathen out there. But now he's going to say to you, he says, and now you who know because of the scriptures. Ooh, ooh, wow. We love, don't we? We love to call ourselves people of the book. Right? So now, Paul might be aiming his guns at me. Now I'm not clapping anymore. I'm wondering what he's going to say next. And what he says next is, and you do the same things. Because he's listed in Romans chapter 1, all the wicked things that those people who turn away from God do with their lives and do to other people. And they're bad. They're evil. And that's why they were clapping and saying, yep, they're evil. Uh -huh. But now you, he says. And that's when they all get very quiet. It's when I get quiet. Because I growed up with the Bible. Did you? You know the scriptures and, and you do the same things. Folks, we live in the valley. We live in the valley of the shadow of death. Do we really like it here? Are we like the people of Jericho? That when the word of the Lord, when, the, when God's man, through the Bible or through some other discussion, peace in your life when God's person comes and says to you do you really like it here? Now you know you're thinking why, why, why is he asking we have a really nice mall here I, I, I know that that we do we, we live a really good life here Santa, Santa Clarita is known for that. It's a really great place to raise a family, right? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But are these Romans chapter 1 people? Or are they Romans chapter 2 people? Are we Romans chapter 1 people? Or are we Romans chapter 2 people? Because we live in the valley of the shadow of death. Have we, have we become just too comfortable with that in our world today? So that when the prophet comes along, we say, you know what, this is a really nice town. I like my life. No, there's just one problem. It's not connected to real life in God. It makes me think of Revelation chapter 3. The end part, the seventh church. Rich, increased in goods, and don't need any help from the Roman Empire. The words in Revelation chapter 3 that come from the, the church of Laodicea are exact words that were given to the Roman Empire after a huge earthquake that devastated much of Asia Minor. The Roman government came around with aid. And the people of Santa Clarita, I mean, the people of Laodicea just sat back in their black wool robes and said, keep it. We don't need it. Because you see, we are rich and increased in goods and don't need anything. Thanks very much. On your way, go help somebody else because we don't need what help you have 
for us. They just don't know their situation that they are living in the valley of the shadow of death. And they like it. They like it. They're comfortable with it. So the third, the third thing that I would provoke your minds with this morning is uh, if we then come to the realization that yes, we are living in the valley of the shadow of death, are we interested in intervention? Do we need help? Do we need the help that the God of Elisha can give us? I would say that if we even would remotely represent the salt of the earth, that we are going to need the power in the salt in order to be effective as salt. What do you say? So there's a prescription, there's a prescription that's given to us if we are interested in that intervention. You have to be a new bowl. You heard that in the lesson today. Maybe you read it also this week in Peter. You have to be a new creation. You cannot, in your current form, do this on your own. Elisha did not go over to the spring and stick his finger in it to make it well. No, he called for a new bowl that had never been used before and he asked for salt to be put in it. If we would like to be part of that curative agent, that's what salt does, right? Helps to cure. Had a little bit of an allergic reaction last night and employed one of my uh, old methods of clearing out my nasal passages. Raise your hand if you know what a neti pot is. Okay, if you don't, you should. It's an ancient tradition from India and is very effective. You may not need Claritin if you have a neti pot because it cleans out your nasal passages. But I didn't use salt. I probably should have. You're supposed to use a saline, a slight saline solution that helps to, to kill whatever it is that is hurting you in your, in your nasal septum. Might try it again this afternoon. I don't know what set me off, but I'm going to tell you it came on real quick and I was just, I mean, if I didn't have an antihistamine in me right now, I'd be having to put this over my nose just because it's, it's hit me that much. Salt is a curative and it is a preventative. If you would like to be part of that part of society in the valley of the shadow of death that gets thrown into the bad waters. You hearing me, church? Because that's who we think we are. We don't think we're Romans chapter 1 Christians. No, no. We believe in God. But have we become too comfortable living in the valley of the shadow of death that we have not realized that we are disconnected from the life giver? His power is not flowing through us. And so there is no reproduction. That's the word that's right there in this passage. Miscarriages of our intentions to reproduce after the kind of heaven. It's not happening. We say to ourselves, why is our church not growing? Why why is the kingdom of God not growing? Well, maybe today's story helps us to understand. There's bad water out there. If you drink the bad water you won't be able to reproduce after the kind that comes from the living water. The trees will cast off their fruit early. We call that abortion. 
So are we interested, are we really, really interested in the intervention of the God of Elisha? Then you have to be a new bowl. You have to, you have to be filled with salt. And that salt is the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit. And then lastly, we, we have to, you have to know that, that if you are salt and if you, you want to be used as salt was intended to be used as curative and preventative, then you are going to be sent into the bad water. So <laughs> this, is, this is where we, you know, we talk about being in Santa Clarita, but not of Santa Clarita. Now that's a, that, 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 I don't know if that hurts you. I, I hope it doesn't hurt you. But it's, we are living here, but we're not satisfied with what is going on here because it doesn't show the signs of life. And so God sends us into that situation to help others to know Him and get reconnected with Him. And then we perform the function of, of, of salt and light. Because really there are, there, there are lots of your friends. I mean, you, you could probably all stand up and say, yeah, I've got a friend like that. Uh, you know, people who are stressed, people who are confused, I mean, the papers are full of them. I don't even think they have enough time in the news these days. They have to choose between the stories. And of course, they choose the, the most outrageous ones. I mean, Chris brought to my attention the, the cannibalism that was reported recently. Yes, in the United States, not New Guinea. Okay, so are we okay with that? Do we, do we understand that there may be some people living in very nice houses here in Santa Clarita whose lives are falling apart? Chris and I are very convinced that it is. It is more difficult to live now than when our parents were alive. Her parents are resting. They, they, they got almost to 90, both of them. It is harder to live today. It's harder to hold it together today. There is just so much that is trying to pull the family apart. There's just so much that is going on. And we get comfortable with that. I say it's time to realize we live in bad water. We live in, in water that is not productive for the kingdom of heaven. The reproduction that we are called as, as people who, who listen to the Spirit of God, that reproduction isn't being seen. And don't we know that text? Finish it for me. By their fruits. Okay, so what happened to the tree that Jesus parted the leaves on and didn't find any fruit? What did he say? You ain't never going to have fruit ever again. Now, is that the pronouncement that we would like on our life? That when the God of creation who designed us to be a certain way comes and looks for fruit, which is reproduction, that he finds none, and then takes away our ability to ever produce again because we weren't producing when we should have. Now, I don't know if you're, you're saying, Pastor, you've gone to meddling now and, and you're making me feel uncomfortable. Well, um, let's just go to the end of the story. They lived happily ever after. No, that's what the Bible says. That spring produced good water after the pronouncement of God upon it and the salt being thrown into it, it produced living water ever after that. So now if you have figured it out, the story is that Jesus was ascending to heaven just like Elijah. And his disciples went back to Jerusalem and they received the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And when they did, they connected people who heard in their own language the words of life. 
and said, we need this. What must we do, brothers? And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized. Come to newness of life and you will be saved. And they added 3,000 to the membership of that group that day. And the Bible says they kept on adding more and more. And the coolest thing about it, at the very end, it says that this new group that was invigorated by the Spirit of God enjoyed the favor of all the people in Jerusalem. So survey says, uh, you know, the Pew Trust did a survey and it came back that 100% of those surveyed thought that this new Christian movement was cool. Why? Well, you can read it this afternoon. Acts chapter 2. They had everything in common. They took care of each other. It meant something to be part of their group. Yeah, that's why they had to have deacons and, 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 and deaconesses. That's why we're going to do a nominating committee, right? So, you know, if you like, if you are interested in helping to take care of people, put your name down when we ask you, I'd like to be a deaconess. I'd like to be a deacon. I'd like to do something in the church to take care of the people of the church. That's why they elected seven deacons. Because the apostles said, hey, we've got to, we've got to be teaching and preaching. We need somebody else to be waiting tables. Because even in that early church, they started having problems. Oh, the Greek widows are getting more than the Israelite, or not getting enough as the Israelite widows. They were helping, you see. But everybody had to be helped the same. Friends, the Spirit of God is calling today to me and to you. What do you want to happen? Do you want to be part of what he's going to do in Santa Clarita? Maybe what he's already doing that we just haven't been noticing? Do you want to do that? We're going to sing a song and we're going to pray. While that's happening, I'm going to leave that, that question with you and I'm going to ask you that as you go into your summertime now and uh, you know we, we, we know that they'll be traveling and they'll be There'll be uh, all kinds of fun things that will happen. I mean, just look at the ads that are going on. You know, come and have your, your summer at Wolf Lodge or Six Flags or wherever. Well, while the rest of the world is going into its summer program, could we, could we maybe say to ourselves, you know, Lord, this summer, this summer, please bring somebody to me that I can be salt and light to. Would you dare to pray that prayer? Because I mean, you're going to have to dare because it might just change your life. Because if he says yes and he brings you somebody, it may scare you. I, I, you know, because it could be your boss or it could be a coworker or, or it could be somebody that you have never let your light shine before with. And, and, and then they come to you and they ask you, could you please come and, and see to the bad water in my life? I just don't seem to be getting ahead. And you know that that's God saying to you, you get to be the salt. I'm throwing you into the bad water in this kid's life, in this person's life. I'm throwing you into that. Are you ready? Are you ready to be salt and light in this situation? I will make you a new creation and you're going to go into that life and it's going to be connected to the life giver ever afterwards. Are you ready for that? This is the summertime. Maybe there's going to be more time to do that. Maybe, maybe you're going to be at your job and you're going to have time at lunch to talk to somebody. I'm going to start praying for this congregation that God is going to send people to you. Because I believe that in your heart of hearts, you are not satisfied with where we are. I've got to believe that. And if you are satisfied, I'm going to pray that God makes you unsatisfied. I'm just telling you, because he wants fruit in our lives. He wants fruit from this congregation. And we will know that there is fruit because there are other people who have been connected to the life-giving force of Jesus Christ. Amen.